I'm joined by two people who have been pretty instrumental in uh, the life of the Bunskol Gilgach to date. Um, just tell us, to start with, really, um, how, how did it come to be? Well, it all started back in 1996. Um, we, um, groups of, I think there were three families uh, were, were raising their children um, uh, as Manx Gaelic speakers. And um, the most unlikely of, of people, myself and a fellow called Chris Sheard, um, started a play group because uh, our partners were both teachers. Uh, so we started this play group, and uh, this was just for the kids because it was if you are raising your ch- child in a language that most other people don't speak, it's good to find other children that. Uh, that are learning the same language. So this was uh, a bit of a novel idea. So yeah, it it was quite new. And uh, I mean, I think Bob Carswell also of of Manx Radio uh, fame uh, had been doing something like this with his kids, he he and his his wife at the time. Uh, So it it hadn't, it wasn't a first for the island, but but it was fairly new at the time in terms of uh, there wasn't anyone else doing that. Um, so we were doing this for a few years, and then we thought to ourselves, well, um, oh, we gathered a few more families and a few more people, and people were saying, yeah, well, actually, we wouldn't mind sending our children along to this. And, uh, so then we uh, set up uh, Monja Vega, um, started off at uh, Braddon Schoolhouse, still there, um, and um, still a few p- places left, if any, <laughs> anyone's interested. Look up, look up Monja Vega and you'll find us. Um, and um, so we started the play group, and that again was quite successful. And then we were getting to the point where the children were getting a bit too old. Uh, well, they were ready to go to school, and we were thinking, well, what happens after this? You know, we've we've gone to all this trouble. We've uh, well, it wasn't so much trouble, but it, you know, we the children were practically uh, fluent uh, Manx speakers. Um, ready to go to school, and there was absolutely no provision whatsoever for them in the in the education system. So, I think probably about a year before they were due uh, to to start at primary school, uh, we said, right, okay, well, we need to start lobbying the department. So we did, and then the department said, well, you can have half a day a week, and I suspect their their thoughts were the half day a week of um, tuition. Um, they, they they said we could have the, the old Santon School house or the, the old Santon School I should say and children from all around the island would be shipped there uh, to, uh, to, to do half a day a week of uh, tuition through the Manx language and these were primary school children So was it always um, envisioned, envisioned this would be immersion education well, even, even at that point? Absolutely, absolutely um, No, it was that, that was the, 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 the absolute fundamental uh, was that this should be immersion learning and, and for, for those who don't understand it basically means you speak the language that, that, that you want the children to learn rather than teach them about the language and of course that is actually how children learn to speak languages you know the, across the, the world there are lots and lots of people in fact uh, the vast majority of people in the world speak more than two languages uh, or sorry more than one language and um, uh, they do that uh, in, in a sort of a process of osmosis they, they, they pick up the language uh, by hearing it being spoken by the communities in which they live uh, so that's how we were going to do it. So anyway, we got this half day a week session at Santon Old School. Uh, I was pretty sure, maybe I'm being a bit cynical, uh, that uh, the idea was this would be able to prove once and for all that this was a flash in the pan thing and it wouldn't work because parents wouldn't support it. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, <laughs> uh, or fortunately for us, I should say, uh, the uh, it, it turned out that the parents did support it and they were very keen and actually the half day a, a, a week session was oversubscribed um, so we then went to the department and uh, said well okay um, how, what's the chances of us having a, a unit within a school uh, now this was the model that was, uh, was used very successfully in Scotland for teaching uh, Scottish Gaelic and uh, we thought well let's let's have a go at that um surely that would be possible on the island and uh, 
we were sort of talked out of it a bit by uh, uh, one or two of the officials who said, well, I don't think that the, the department will go for this, but, uh, well, you, I suppose you could. Um, so anyway, cutting a long story short, we did uh, approach the minister and said, look, this is what we would like to do. We, we would need the support of the department uh, to, to do this. Who, and, was, who was the minister uh, at the time? And, of course, the minister was Steve Roden, and Steve uh, was... Uh, uh, Steve's children were, were brought up bilingually because obviously his, his wife comes from Mexico so uh, they were brought up bilingually so S- Steve got the whole idea about bilingual education um, and of course uh, the, 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 the key thing for us uh, about learning La- uh, Manx was it's part of our heritage and culture and identity um, but uh, the selling point that we used in all our sort of documentation to the department was this is about expanding children's horizons. It's about uh, helping children become more creative thinkers, creative writers, and there's loads and loads of academic research now that demonstrates that bilingual education does that. Lots um, of that, lots of that research has been done in the interim period, of course. Well, and, it has. And yeah. uh, you you mentioned um, some of the parallel things happening in Scotland. Did you look to other? Uh, jurisdictions as well. Obviously, there's lots of immersion schooling in in Ireland, and yeah. there was at that time, for example. We we did um, the the Irish situation when we were starting. Uh, it was kind of in a bit of a transition because the uh, the Irish Free State had set up a, a system uh, of, of compulsory Irish, um, and it was just well, it was be, becoming openly recognised that 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 had been a, f- a bit of a failure. Um, whereas lots of pe- people were Irish speakers. They were Irish speakers because they were forced to at school, and then they never touched the language once they once they could get away with with, with not having to do it anymore. So, so I, I think uh, it was recognised that the system wasn't really working as well as it might uh, in Ireland. Added to which, uh, in terms of the the sort of the the, the geography and the and the the, the general uh, position of the language, uh, we were much more akin to what was going on in Scotland. You know, you, you could you could see an awful lot more similarities than uh, the the Irish situation, where effectively the state was behind uh, a bilingual uh, system. Was, yeah. was, was, was sorry. Sorry, go I was on. saying really our system. I think. It could be described as sort of developing from the bottom up rather than something that had sort of come from, yeah. from above, trickle yeah. down. And in the, the initial stages you're talking about, Phil, it wasn't just yourself and a couple of, well, a couple of families. There, there was a, a parents' organisation who began to lobby quite uh, extensively, Shezik and parent, and, mm-hmm. um, and that was came from a range of families and parents, not all from the island by a long chalk, but all with different, and not always with exactly the same motivations, but very interested in the, the, the bilingual idea or the Manx idea or both. Um, so we had a, a relatively reasonable number of children of the right age at one point and i think this was this was the stroke of fortune really all these ideas would be fine but if we only had two or three children or two or three interested families at any point it would never happen but i think we eventually got to the point when there were about sort of nine or ten children who of the same age um who'd been through the same experiences at um, preschool groups we who parents knew they could trust um trust us as individuals i think um and the children had already made some progress in manx so i think it gave us a confidence um and uh, in combination with connections with the the politicians at the time and extensive lobbying i i think we were quite fortunate that these elements all came together at the right time because presumably there would have been a handful of families or a handful of children uh, in previous years that that might have been keen had the opportunity been available then so or do you th- do you think that's maybe not quite true i don't know i think it's a uh, there was a mix really i, I mean and, uh, annie of course is absolutely right that uh, we we established this uh, organization sheshik the parents and and um of course as an individual family you could raise your children through manx and a number of people did um, but i think possibly the unique thing um, about where we were was uh, that there were more than you know, there was more than one family at any at any one point that was doing this, uh, and then when we came together and then started talking about the idea and explaining how it was working in Scotland and and 
talking about uh, you know the, the broader picture rather than just focusing on heritage and identity but this was a, a much broader and more advantageous uh, uh, way of learning um, we, uh, we expanded the, the field quite dramatically and and people yeah people just said well yeah of course we should be doing this why on earth are we not doing this uh, so it was good